Welcome back, everyone, and today we're talking about Yeshua's Hasidic dynasty, as particularly the procession of the royal line of Jesus, Yeshua, and the role of the royal family, so to speak, in church history, or what would be later called church history. Now, kind of just jumping into this quickly, because uh, we have a few slides today. I'm trying to keep these under an hour, and sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. So here's just our overview for today. We're going to be looking at uh, something that's already somewhat familiar to us, Hasidut, or Hasidus, as it's alternatively pronounced. We'll also be talking about John, or Yohanan, and Yeshua as the founders of this dynasty, and also the family of Yeshua, and by extension John, and the dynasty that sprung from their family. So, first of all, when we're dealing with Hasidut, or Hasidus, these are two different uh, pronunciations because of two different dialects. You have the European, which is the Ashkenazi, and you have the Sephardi, which is the uh, North African and Middle Eastern. And so they pronounce these things differently, but it's the same concept, right? One uses the S, one uses the T. It's because in Hebrew, the letter... Tav is uh, pronounced two different ways. It's uh, Sometimes if you read a, a Christian Hebrew learning book, it'll say T-H-A-W. It'll pronounce it as thaw, like you're thawing meat, right? Or you are thawed out when you come inside for the winter, right? Um, and it's because there are, it's one of those letters in the Hebrew language that are just strange. They can be pronounced different ways. And actually, the Yemenite uh, Jews that live in just south of Saudi Arabia, they pronounce it as Tha, right? So, maybe Zondervan's going off of them, I don't know. Uh, but anyways, we'll be getting into Hasidus today. That's just the, the way that I normally pronounce it, so we'll be going with that. Uh, what is a Hasid, right? We've talked about this probably for, I don't know, ten lessons or so by now, right? They are the, the pious, the, the righteous... They go above and beyond what the Torah requires. They are merciful. They love mercy. They love love, right? They're not hippies, but they love to do good to people. And it's not just the righteous standards set down in the Torah. It is also being a nice person. It is showing kindness. And all of these things are mandated in the Torah, but they're things that are especially expressed by the Hasidim. So, we already know enough about them for now, uh, so I'm not going to dwell on that too much. But then I'd like to get into something that, again, we've already covered this, but kind of setting the precedent for, I'm sorry, not the precedent, the, uh, the foundation for today's teaching. How is Hasidus different from mainstream Judaism? And it's because, kind of what we just talked about is that there's extra emphasis on showing love, showing kindness. And in Judaism, kindness and love and, and mercy, these are all things that are part of it. It's not like they're absent. They exist, and they're important. But these people, the Hasidim, go, they, they put it on steroids. They want to be extra loving, extra kind, extra merciful, extra pious, and extra uh, observant of the Torah. So, these are all things that are connected from the, the Jewish mind. I know today in Christianity we think, oh, law versus grace, right? Or uh, obligation versus kindness, or strictness versus niceness, right? You can be strictly nice, can't you? Right? You can be determined, I am going to be nice no matter what today, right? You can, you can make up in your mind, I am going to be nice today. There's nothing wrong with that. You're being a strictly nice person. Or you are strict about showing mercy, right? That's just that's who the Hasidim are, right? We should have a, a, a general idea of who these people are. So, again, we're not going to be dwelling on this. But then another question that we have is, how did Yeshua and his disciples, and by extension probably uh, John the Baptizer, his disciples too, I would assume at least, um, I would assume that they're not radically different people, right, coming from the same family. Um, 
How did Yeshua and his family and his disciples show chesed, loving kindness, and teach chesedus? Well, he taught in a number of different ways to go the extra mile. Like, literally, or even figuratively, right? Go above and beyond what you need to do, technically what you have to do. If you uh, have the obligation to help someone who's on the road... This is kind of the whole point of the, the Good Samaritan passage, right? Is that if you have the obligation to help someone, but let's say that you're a priest, you're a Kohen, and you have to make sure that you're not defiled for the sake of being able to do your other duties in the temple. So we have a problem, right? Help the person, which is commanded by God, or stay pure and serve in the temple, which is commanded by God. Which one should you do? And Hasidic teaching would say that helping people, showing kindness, is greater than other things. It's not that you do one and not the other, but it is saying that in a circumstance where they conflict, or it seems like you can't do both, kindness wins out in the end. Which is kind of like where the the verse from, I think, in Hosea that Yeshua quotes, that mercy, chesed, is greater than sacrifice. Now, it's not in some kind of universal sense where it's always greater than, than sacrifice, but it's saying in a circumstance where there's some kind of conflict where you can't do both, he's saying chesed you know, mercy, loving kindness, wins. It is, it's greater, it is heavier, it's weightier, it's more important in that particular circumstance. But when you can do both, then do both, right? There's no problem. There's nothing to have to weigh. There's no, there's no challenge. So we find examples of this in various places in the New Testament, but just to have uh, a few examples here, we find in John 13, he says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the gentle, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Right? Referring to the piety, referring to being strict, at least with yourself. Right? It's not our jobs to tell other people what to do, it's our jobs to take care of ourselves, make sure that we're doing the right thing, and if people want help, then we can help them. Uh, you know, if they're making some kind of egregious error, then maybe you can address it with them, but um, basically mind your own business. <laughs> Blessed are the merciful, right? A recurring theme here. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the warm fuzzies, basically, right? And the warm fuzzies are good, but they need to be coupled with the, you know, stainless steel kind of stuff too, right? The, it's very plain and bleak. and Not bleak, but it, it's a very... It's not a very emotionally arousing, right? It's just, eh, okay, whatever. I did it. I went through the motions. <laughs> but it's having a Hasidic attitude that brightens everything. It brightens the stainless steel and turns it into warm fuzzies. Right? He also says in Matthew 5, Your righteousness should surpass the Pharisees. So the Pharisees are this righteous, right here. You need to be above that and be even more righteous than what they're doing. So, which by the way, if the Pharisees were just a bunch of wicked people, saying that you need to be more righteous than wicked people, that's nothing. Right? That's like saying, uh, you know, be a nicer person than Hitler. Right? That, that's not a teaching. That's stupidity. It, it, everybody already knows to be nicer than Hitler, right? Except Hitler, you know? So, saying you gotta be better than the worst people isn't saying anything. But if these are generally good people that are well-esteemed in society, that actually do a lot of good, at least they're supposed to and they try to, right? No one's a perfect robot. 
Yeshua is saying, be better than the good people. Because which is harder, being better than good people or being better than bad people, right? Just a thought. I know we've already covered some of this stuff before. Now, we're introducing a new concept here of Yeshua as a Rebbe, which is basically a, a form of the word rabbi, but it's referring to a leader of a Hasidic group. Uh, it's a word that came about in the 1700s, I believe, but we can uh, kind of anachronistically apply this to Yeshua because he fits the same role. So, these are things that a Rebbe does. He gives guidance and advice. Now we know that people would come to Yeshua all the time, right? Asking for advice, coming with a legal question, saying, can you heal my, uh, my friend, my daughter, my son, my, whoever. And we find an example of this in John 12, when certain Greeks come up to meet Yeshua and they say, we would like to see him, right? And there's the, the time where the woman and her daughter, or the soldier and his child, right? This happens all the time. This is a... Maybe not a daily occurrence for Yeshua, but it's happening a lot. We also find that the Rebbe is a servant to his Hasidim. So, uh, you know, they, they need a babysitter, he'll come over. If they need help koshering their kitchen, he'll come over. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe if he can loan somebody money, he might do that. You know, he's, he's there to help people. He's not just some guy who gets up in the pulpit and says, y'all gonna burn in hell if you don't believe, right? He actually benefits his congregation <laughs> in, uh, in material ways and not just giving advice, which I think is kind of what we think of when we think of uh, a rabbi as a as kind of big Jewish hotshot teacher who uh, knows a lot and teaches people stuff, right? But a rabbi actually does more than that. He, it's like, you know, Rabbi Plus, Rabbi 2.0 or something like that. Um, and actually, and some rabbis have taken this on themselves uh, where they don't become a rabbi in their own right, but they're simply copying the good attributes, the good midot, M-I-D-D-O-T, there's another Hebrew word for it. Uh, they're copying the good midot, of their Rebbe. So, basically, follow me as I follow the Rebbe, right? That's what Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. It's the same kind of concept where uh, even rabbis today, they look to their Rebbe and they think, that's a good quality, I don't have to do that, but it's good. It's a non-mandatory good thing. So, we know that they give Guidance and advice. A Rebbe gives, is a servant. And we know, you know, Yeshua says in Matthew 20, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And by the way, these roles are coming straight out of Orthodox Jewish books here. I'm not just making things up. In fact, um, let's go back to the beginning. Yeah, To Be Hasidic by Rabbi Chaim Dolphin. That's where I'm getting these things from. Um, which it, It's a great book, by the way. I enjoyed it. Um... Maybe you will too. You can find it on Amazon. I think it's, I don't know, 15, 20 bucks, something like that. Um, maybe more. I don't know. I haven't checked in a while. Anyways, as we've already covered before, um, actually, as we just covered right now, he's a teacher and a rabbi, which we've already covered how Yeshua is a teacher and a rabbi. A rebbe is sometimes even considered a miracle worker. Um, where his Hasidim will tell stories about how they went to the Rebbe and um, the, the, Re the Rebbe said a blessing and they went home and, you know, they're, um, if they were financially strapped, they'd find a hundred bucks in their account somehow um, or they'd find it in a parking lot or their child was healed or, you know, something that they had lost in their house that was very valuable, like a family heirloom or something, that they found it that same day. So it's like, hmm, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe there's something to it, I don't know. Uh, but this is something that a Rebbe can sometimes do. It's not that they have to. A Rebbe is foremost a leader, but some of them have been known to work miracles as well. And lastly, uh, a Rebbe is considered by his Hasidim 
to be a tzaddik. Think about it, half the words in that sentence are Hebrew, but that's good. We're learning. <laughs> uh, like Rebbe is technically Yiddish. but So, a Rebbe is considered by his Hasidim to be a tzaddik. And we've already covered the, the whole concept of the tzaddik in you know two or three uh, lessons, so we're not going to really get into that because we've previously covered that. So, getting into Yeshua's family, in the Gospel according to the Hebrews, which is a non-canonical gospel that the original believers used, at least some of them did, and this was used by the Nazarenes. And so, while we don't have it today, and there's only actually fragments of it that exist today, that, oddly enough, were preserved by their enemies, and so, <laughs> because they would quote, they would quote this gospel and say, "Here's how it's wrong," um, but that what that shows us, fortunately, is that it existed at all, right? So, we find in the Gospel of the Hebrews, um, the passage that says this: "The mother of the Lord and his brothers said to him, Yohanan the Immerser, John the Baptizer, baptizes for the forgiveness of sins." Let us go and be baptized by him. So, something that I find especially interesting is that Yeshua's whole family wants to take Yeshua. They're all going to go on a family outing down to the river. And they're all together going to immerse as a family. Now that's interesting. Because I think, I think the whole concept of Yeshua's family is interesting. That's why we're doing a lesson on it today. Because... Uh, I think that they tend to be marginalized, right? How often do you hear a, a sermon about his family? Um, but what's fascinating is that, first of all, they want to go repent, which means that they're righteous people. And second of all, they all want to do it together. So you can assume that they're, they're pretty close, right? They don't hate each other. They're not, you know, they haven't talked to each other in five years. They probably talk to each other every single day. And they seem to be getting along very fine. And this is in addition to other things that we know. This is not just, you know, drawing things out of these two sentences here. But, so, additionally, we have Acts 1, verse 14. It says, All the disciples with one mind were continually devoting themselves to the prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Yeshua, and with his brothers. Now, we find that the original family, the family of Yeshua, has an active part in the original movement, the origin, what, uh, what historians call the original Jesus movement, or the Nazarenes. And while they're not listed necessarily as disciples or apostles, sometimes they are. So why Luke decides to put them into different groups, I'm not totally sure. Maybe it's because they were so highly esteemed, it was a way of saying, yeah, everyone was there, you know, uh, all the disciples and all of them, and even, even the people that we so dearly love and hold up, we had Mary. Mary herself was there, and his brothers were there. It was fantastic. Yeah, and then everyone else too. Does that make sense? So by singling them out, he actually might be lifting them up and praising them and exalting them, not as deities, God forbid, but as very good, righteous, famous people within the Nazarene movement, right? And so, moving on, we, have, we see according to Luke 1 and Mark 6, the verses you see on the screen, we find certain people in Yeshua's family, straight out of the New Testament itself. We have John the Baptizer, which is Yeshua's cousin, and the first leader of this early first century messianic teshuva, repentance, movement. And he preached in the 20s CE. Right, because we know that John and Jesus, Yochanan and Yeshua, were born within six months' time of each other. Right, this is what the, the Gospels say. And so, we know that Yeshua was born at the latest 4 BC, 
because Herod died at that time. So we know that John was born around that time too. You know, maybe 5 BC or whenever they were born. And really the specific dates don't really matter, but it, just to clarify that a little bit. And knowing that they were about 30, according to the gospel record, if you go 30 years into the future, you get into the mid-20s. There's no 33 AD that we're talking about here. In fact, uh, Yeshua was well ascended by that point. <laughs> um, but we have John the Baptizer, who's Yeshua's cousin, and he kind of kicks this thing off, at least according to the gospels. Who knows... You know, maybe his his family, maybe Zechariah and Elizabeth were part of something. Who knows? Um, we also have the person who's known as James the Just in church history. He's alternatively called Yaakov Hadzadik. Maybe we find that word, the Zadik again, right? The Just, the Righteous, same word, Zadik. Uh, successor of Yeshua and an author, actually the author, of an epistle in the New Testament. So we find that he takes over after Yeshua, and he's kind of in charge of all Nazarene operations. Now after that we find Shimon, who is the successor of James, Joseph, or Yosef, who is the successor of Shimon, it's believed, or something like that. Um, it gets a little tricky in determining that. We also have Yehuda, or Judah, Judas, who is the author of the epistle of Jude. We also find that Yeshua has sisters, who, again, are not often talked about. Uh, how many sisters did he have? He had at least, how many folks? All you mathematicians out there? Grammarians? Two, right? Sisters, plural, he had at least two sisters. Uh, I personally think he probably had three or four. That's just my opinion. Uh, not terribly important. But Either way, Yeshua had a kind of a large family. He had, what, I think maybe four brothers, he himself, and two sisters. So that's at least seven people, plus Mary and Joseph, that's nine. <laughs> and if I'm correct in thinking that he had three or four sisters, I mean, just think about this. He has, like, what, ten or eleven people in his family? Um, and then there are others, like his aunts and his uncles, Yes, which Yeshua did have, right? He had aunts and uncles, Elizabeth. The mother of John the Baptizer was his aunt. And this shouldn't be terribly controversial, but sometimes people get kind of weirded out. Oh, Yeshua was you know, descended from heaven and the virgin birth, and he didn't have any family whatsoever. What? <laughs> Some people get very freaked out by this stuff. I don't know why. Even though the uh, we're just pulling verses out of the New Testament and reading it. Um, according to Hegesippus... Turning now to James, otherwise known as Yaakov, uh, according to Hegesippus, which uh, lived, I think, in the middle of the 2nd century, he's a church historian and theologian. He references James, which I almost read the quote here without looking at it. <laughs> he says, James, the brother of the Lord, who was surnamed the just by all, and Oblias, or Tzadik and Ozleam. So we find that Hegesippus, who is a Greek-speaking Gentile Christian, from this collective church memory or something, or by tradition or legend or who knows, he's passing down this Hebrew term that James was called, Tzadik. Hegesippus just tells us he was called Tzadik, right? And according to Dictionary.com, which I think we all understand that they are not the, the premier source on theological definitions, but just to kind of tie this into this theme of a Hasidic dynasty, uh, I thought it was useful for this purpose. They define a Zadik as a person of outstanding virtue and piety, which is kind of the, the direction that we've looked into. The leader of a Hasidic group, which... Yeshua and James both were. They both led the group. Uh, Yeshua first, obviously. And then once he left, or well, he ascended, then James comes on the scene and is the leader. Well, he enters as a leader. Um, a Jewish or Hasidic spiritual leader 
a Jewish righteous person also called Zadik, Zadik, or Zadik, right? <laughs> um, for those who are just listening, they're not paying attention to the screen, it says the word in three different ways. So, uh, it also means righteous or just. So, we find that James was considered a Zadik, even by the early church. <laughs> Uh, now, did they know what a Zadik really was? No, probably not. Uh, they probably wouldn't have even used that term if they fully knew what it meant and all of its uh, intricate mystical meanings. Uh, did they think that you know James could uh, atone for people's sins? There were some people who kind of had that line of thought, and we'll be looking at a quote later, but most people did not believe that because... Uh, everything had become very Jesus-centered at this time, in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century. And uh, especially by the 4th the century, nobody was talking about James. I mean, who's James? Who, he's some kind of, you know, hat salesman, or I don't know. But back in the early days, he was the most prominent person in the movement. And some people, it's believed, some people even knew James and was more famous among some people than Yeshua himself, simply because Yeshua preached for about a year and a half to three years, somewhere along there, whereas James was preaching in Jerusalem for 30 years. So, it's understandable why people might know of him better than Yeshua. Uh, at least some people, obviously not everybody. So, continuing with James, here's the quote, or here's a, a longer quote. And Hegesippus had received a tradition or legend about James, which, who knows if it's true, but this is something that has been passed down to us, which may or may not be true. I think that, to say that this whole thing is bogus, I think that's a bit of a stretch, but uh, I think that some of this is probably pretty accurate. So, let's get into it. Hegesippus says, try saying that five times fast, <laughs> Hegesippus says, James, the brother of the Lord, was surnamed the just by all, from the days of our Lord until now. And he received the government of the church with the apostles. Now that's a very uh, generous uh, motion to the apostles, because in other accounts it says that only James had the, the government of the church. The apostles didn't, it was just him. <laughs> or they'll say that he was on top and all the, all the other apostles were below him in terms of authority. This apostle was consecrated from his mother's womb. He drank neither wine nor fermented liquors and abstained from animal food. A razor never came upon his head. He never anointed with oil and never entered a bathhouse. Which, by the way, it doesn't mean he was stinky. It simply means that he didn't go into these unholy places because bathhouses were, were, were places where people would get naked and walk around naked, uh, basically like a, a sauna or a, a gym today, right? People walk around basically naked. Um, so that's, that's what it's referring to. He alone was allowed to enter the sanctuary, which, by the way, to enter the sanctuary, you need to immerse in water. <laughs> Which is why it's probably referring to, when it says a bath, a bathhouse. It's not that he never bathed. Um, because it says right here that to get into the sanctuary, you need to bathe. Um, he never wore wool clothes, but only linen garments. Which, interestingly enough, that's something that the priests would do. Now, James was not a Levite, but... He has some kind of connection with them, it seems. At least he's he's taking on priestly traditions and incorporating them into his own life. Which, by the way, the, the Pharisees and the Essenes were known for doing. Right, That's the main thing that distinguished them from the Sadducees. Uh, one of the main things. He was in the habit of entering the temple alone and was often found upon his bended knees and interceding for the forgiveness of the people. Who's the people? Right? The Jewish people, right? It's not just his own family. It's not just his friends. Remember what Yeshua said, bless them that curse you. Not just bless them that bless you, right? Bless them that curse you. So 
while the entire Jewish people were not cursing James, that would be impossible, by the way, uh, not even all Jews today curse any one person other than maybe Haman uh, from the Esther story, but that's beside the point. Um, but we find that James is interceding for the forgiveness of the Jewish people. Which would make him an intercessor, which, according to our previous lectures, what does that make him? It makes him, in a spiritual sense, not a literal sense, but a spiritual sense, it makes him a priest. Which, looking at, he's only wearing linen garments, and he's supposedly not drinking wine, and he's going into the temple every day. It's a very priestly profile that we're looking at. Now, because Yeshua and James were related by blood, he couldn't have been a Levite because it says that Yeshua was a Jew. He was not a Levite. A Jew in a, a ethnic sense. So, while the, again, while this isn't literal, it is... Uh, he's manifesting on the outside what he has going on on the inside. So, on the inside, he is praying. He is begging God... He's going to the temple, probably in tears, crying for the forgiveness of his people. But he's also, in a sense, acting and dressing like a priest to mirror his heart condition. Now, did he have the, the priestly privileges? No. But that's not the point. Anyways, so he was interceding for the forgiveness of the people, so that his knees, because he was bending down to pray so much, so that his knees became hard as camel knees. Which is why his nickname also was not just Zadik, but camel knees. In consequence of his exceedingly great piety, right, that's what the Hasidim do, they have great piety. In consequence of his exceedingly great piety, he was called the just and oblias, or Zadik and Ozlayam which signifies justice and protection of the people. I'm going to repeat that. This is the, remember, the second century church historian defining what a tzaddik is, at least to his understanding. A tzaddik, which signifies justice and protection of the people, as the prophets declare concerning him. So th he's even saying that the prophets had prophesied about James, too, not just Yeshua. Which, by the way, that's a very Jewish thing to do, is to say that the prophets prophesied about somebody that you know. right? There's actually nothing un-Jewish about it. Jews did that all the time. Uh, I mean, not every day, but they did that often. So what I find interesting is that he says the Zadik, which we know signifies justice or righteousness, right? Righteous. It comes from the German, richtig. Justice comes from justus, which is Latin. Just two different languages describing the same concept here. So describing justice or righteousness, which we know that the Zadikim are incredibly righteous people. That's what defines them as a Zadik. And protection of the people. How does he protect the people? He's probably a scrawny, you know, five foot six guy living in the Middle East. And... He's not eating animal products, at least according to this account. So he's not a very buff guy here, at least presumably. So he's not a warrior. How is he protecting the people? He's not a warrior, and he's not a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> so he's not defending the people in court. So how is he defending the people? As it says, he's interceding for the forgiveness of the people. That's what the Zadikim do, is that they are intercessors for the people. Not in the sense that you have to go through them to get to God, but in the sense that God has to go through them to get to you. They're like a wall that protects you, so when you kill them, when you knock down the wall, the punishment that you've deserved all along, there you go. Now, what's interesting is that the early church fathers say that it was the death of James that caused the destruction of the temple. In Jewish tradition, it was brotherly hatred 
It was the lack of brotherly love that caused the destruction of the temple. It could be both. It could be that not only the death of James, as we'll be getting into because he was murdered, um, in fact, it might even just be the next slide. Nope. <laughs> uh, it might be two slides from now. It could have been that the brotherly hatred or the lack of brotherly love resulted in the death of James. And perhaps he, his death was the last straw. I don't know. Or that's the, the meaning that the Nazarenes attributed to the death of James, trying to explain and rationalize this, how is this all fitting together in God's plan? Or maybe it's something that came much later. Who knows? But we find that regardless, regardless, even if they're correct in thinking this, the later Christians who believe this, even if they're not correct, it's still a kind of belief, or the sort of belief, that fits perfectly within Judaism. So whether they were right or wrong, the kind of idea was right. So, we covered who James uh, from what we understand, that's the kind of guy that he was. Right, This is the kind of lifestyle that he had. And in terms of him more from a, uh, from a, a literary sense, in terms of what he wrote, we know that he was the author of the Epistle of James, obviously, because he says so. <laughs> that's the, that's the, the name of the Epistle itself. And he says so in the beginning, in chapter 1. He says, Hey everyone, it's me, James, the brother of the Lord. And he goes on and, and writes. So, we find that early on, his epistle is addressed to the twelve tribes of Israel. Or otherwise known as the tribes of the Gaulis, the diaspora, the dispersion. The, the tribes of Israel that are dispersed abroad, I think is how the, uh, the letter itself says. Now, his epistle's main themes include Jewish ethics... It's not just all, you know, it's not just ethics. It's particularly Jewish ethics. This is called Musar. M-U-S-S-A-R, I believe it is. Musar, it's how to be a good person. Right? That's what Hasidim do. They want to be good people. And Hasidim know that you don't become good people simply by keeping the Torah by robotically keeping certain commandments, you have to infuse life into the commandments, not only to make them enjoyable so that you keep doing them, but to make the commandments acceptable to other people as well. So, for example, there's the commandment to be kind. There's also the command to give to the poor. So what do you do? You, out of your own heart's desire... Give to the poor more than you have to, out of love, because there's also the command to be kind. So, this is kind of the idea here. Anyways, the, the main themes in his epistle include Jewish ethics, Musar, and a call for good works, which I think everybody probably agrees on. It's also why Martin Luther wanted to take the epistle of James out of the New Testament, because he hated it. He hated anything having to do with works. It's only grace, 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 love, 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 warm fuzzies all over. Right? But those aren't bad things, by the way. But they are bad things when you totally neglect the action part of it. It's, you know, I think the way that I see it, it's kind of like Christianity took all the love and the grace and Islam took all the works. <laughs> and, you know, Judaism sitting back and he's like, can we just have our stuff back? They're supposed to be together, they're married. You can't divorce them and call them a full family. Uh, which, by the way, I don't mean to offend divorcees or people from divorced families. I grew up that way, so it's something that I can relate to. Um, but anyways, these are major themes in uh, James' epistle. And they're things that John the Baptizer and Yeshua taught themselves, too. They didn't teach to themselves, they, they themselves taught it. And we can find Hasidic teachings in James' epistle in some of the following places. So in James 1, we find everyone must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. 
So calm down, shut up, and listen. (laughs) For the anger of man, human anger, human wrath, does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted. So humble yourselves and listen to the teaching. The teaching which is able to save your souls. Now wait, I thought it was Jesus who saves our souls. Right? That's, again, that is a, that's a concept that comes later. Yes, the Zadik can protect the people, as we've already said. But James is saying to whoever he's writing to, the, 12, the tribes that are dispersed throughout the world, that it's the word of God that saves. And that's not even a contradiction because, as we've covered before, by obeying Yeshua, we are being saved. Now, is that works-based salvation? Are you saved because of your works? In a certain sense, yeah, you are. Now, does that mean that you go down the checklist? Okay, God, I did everything. You owe me salvation. No. In fact, the sages actually say whoever does that, they go to hell. (laughs) Whoever tries to work for the sake of heaven, you know, for the sake of entering heaven, they don't get into heaven. (laughs) So it's a very delicate balance that uh, I think we all too often uh, cite on one side or the other, trying to please God with works, and then going the other way and saying, well, maybe I need to be a little bit more gentle on myself. Um, I don't have to be so strict. And God's like, no, you don't do that. <laughs> kind of close, but not quite. Here, try again, but not that way. <laughs> uh, in James 2, actually, I didn't finish. Uh, Receive with humility the word implanted, which is able to save your souls, but prove yourselves doers of the word. Okay, so is Leviticus the word of God? Is Deuteronomy the word of God? Is Exodus, Numbers, the word of God? Right? Is the Torah the word of God? Of course it is. I don't know any Christian or any Jew who doesn't think that. Right? Uh, Or if they are, they're probably in a mental hospital somewhere. But we all know that the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, are the word of God. And what does James say here? Prove yourselves. Prove it. You say this, so prove it. Prove that you are doers of the word. Prove that the word is implanted in you by doing it. Right? It, it's radically simple. Huh. Maybe I should hear what the Bible says and do it. It's amazing. It's revolutionary. <laughs> And not merely listeners who delude themselves or who put who who are living a delusional lifestyle, right? Now, what do we find in churches today? We have people who listen to Bible sermons every week and then nobody does anything. Nobody changes their behavior. Nobody becomes humble. Nobody becomes charitable. Nobody becomes more kind. Nobody actually does any commandments because, oh, we're free from the commandments. We don't have to do anything. Right? This is the total opposite of what James was actually teaching. So, kind of continuing with that. <laughs> in James chapter 2, there's, there's too many good quotes. I couldn't fit everything on a you know, 15-point slide or however long this is. Um, in James 2, he says that works and repentance are critical. Now again, if you don't believe anything that I'm saying, go and read James 2. Or even if you do believe what I'm saying, go read James 2. I think it's a a phenomenal epistle. It's one of my favorite books in the New Testament. Um, For reasons that you may or may not suspect. (laughs) Um, And here's just an example. In James 2, verse 13, he says, Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's like the most Hasidic thing that you could say is to say, look, even if people deserve to be come down hard on, even if you can slam the gavel and say, you know, 30 years in prison, which, by the way, biblical times, they didn't 
have prison, uh, at least from what I understand. You get 30 years, but mercy is better. Okay, you know, you haven't been paying your taxes for the past decade. Uh, perhaps you're exceptionally stupid and uh, you don't know how to use a phone to call a tax attorney. Um, maybe that's the case. I don't know if that's the case or not, but maybe it is. And if it's true, then really you can't be held accountable for not paying your taxes. So, okay, we'll reduce your sentence. Or if you can just pay him back, then look, we'll just we'll just say it never happened. We'll move on, right? That's, <laughs> uh, that's, that's the more Hasidic thing to do, is to give people the benefit of the doubt, look for the good that is in them, even if it's really hard. In fact, in Halacha, in the practical application of the Torah, they say that if a court unanimously convicts someone, it's a bogus trial. There has to be a retrial. Why? Because nobody was looking for the good. They were all out to accuse the person. Which means that they are probably biased. If one person couldn't say one good thing, okay, what if we have someone who is a serial rapist who kills his victims? What good can you say about them, right? Maybe he pays his taxes, <laughs> right? That that's a positive thing that you can say without defending the harm that they cause or without defending the sin. Yes, they're a serial rapist and murderer. Could be worse. Could have killed more people. Thank God that they didn't get that far. Maybe that there's a spark of conscious, uh, conscience in the person that influenced them to stop. Who knows? And so if nobody stands up to defend some kind of little ounce of good in this wicked person, it's a bunk trial because they know that you're supposed to look for the good in people. And then that's kind of connected to mercy triumphing over judgment. And even when we look at that in ourselves, our merciful side of our heart must triumph over the judgment side of our heart. This doesn't mean that we always are liberal and lenient and we let everyone go. We, we open up the prisons, let the murderers out. But what it does mean is that when you get angry, when you want to point the finger and judge someone, someone when you want to say... Uh, they're full of tattoos, the hair's a wreck, it's all painted up, the, the eye shadows everywhere, they're a freak. That's judgment. But instead, we're supposed to be merciful, say, maybe they're doing it for attention, maybe they don't feel loved, maybe they need a friend. I'm going to go, when I pass by them, I'm going to smile and say, hey, and then keep walking. Right? All I'm going to do is greet them and say hi. Or if I sit next to them on the bus, how's it going? And if they give you a weird look and look away, then you should be celebrating in your mind, Yes! I was nice to that person and I'm not going to have a horrible emotional reaction and say, Oh, I knew that was going to happen. I knew that they weren't going to accept my smile. That's just like them. You don't know that person. And even if you do that, even if you do know that person, you don't know what they're thinking or feeling. Because ultimately, it's only God who knows the person. So just as we need to outwardly manifest mercy over judgment in a legal sense, we do this in our own personal behavior, too. So what is it saying? Again, basically, it's be nice. Be kind. When there's minor offenses, or things that aren't even offenses, but you just don't like them, excuse them. I'm sure there's got to be a good reason, right? In James 3, we read, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show it by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. So first of all, it's saying that wise people are gentle. <laughs> They're not brash and in your face and, you're going to hell, right? That's not gentle. And by extension, that's not even wise. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Going to hell has made my, my voice cut out. <laughs> um, and what does this say? It, it even says, Good behavior and his deeds combined with the gentleness of wisdom, right? Do good and act good and treat people good, right? Be nice and do nice. Or be nice and play nice. How about that? Um, I think this is our last slide on... James. Okay, two more slides. Um, according to Acts 15 and Galatians 2, James was in charge of the Nazarene movement. We kind of touched on this earlier. But uh, it's something that we can see even demonstrated actively in the New Testament itself. And according to Eusebius, who we'll be referencing more and more as the days go by, or the weeks go by, he says, James, the brother of the Lord, to whom the Episcopal see at Jerusalem was committed by the apostles. So basically, just a bunch of theological mumbo-jumbo saying, James is the brother of Jesus, and the apostles decided to put him in charge. Now other accounts say that Jesus himself made James the, the leader of the Nazarenes in such texts like the Gospel of Thomas, which I don't suggest because it's weird, but it kind of gives credibility that one passage gives credibility to what the other people are saying too. So it could be a kernel of truth in a whole pot of crap for all I know, but that's kind of beside the point. We also know that James had a plan for Gentiles, and it was something kind of along the lines of either conversion to Judaism or acceptance of the Noahide laws, the seven laws of Noah, uh, and he charged people like Paul with executing this plan. So basically, it's ideally, y'all would be converting to Judaism, but we all know that we can't, you can't do this overnight. That's a, a burden that neither we nor our forefathers that could bear. So instead of trying to do everything overnight, how about you just join us now and learn to do it along the way? And this is exactly what Hillel himself says, Rabbi Hillel, which I think we know by now. Yeshua and the, the Nazarenes were much closer to Hillel than Shammai, right? And this is exactly what James is saying, is that he's saying, come Join us. You can be one of us with the expectation that you continue to learn, continue to improve, continue to refine yourselves, continue to acquire the mitzvot, the commandments, to continue to learn how to do the commandments and then actually do them. So, here's our last James slide. Uh, regarding the death of James... In, this is actually Josephus speaking here now, who lived in the first century. He says, Festus was now dead. I think Festus was the, the procurator or the governor or something like that. And Albinus was but upon the road, so he was traveling. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges, or the Court of Judges. This is probably not referring to the big Sanhedrin. He assembled a court of judges and brought before them the brother of Yeshua, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the Torah, he delivered them to be stoned. It's the same thing that we find in the book of Acts with Stephen. He was delivered to be stoned. And so we find that this is the same fate of James. Now what's interesting, in Acts 6, I believe, it says that false witnesses were brought up and accused Stephen and Yeshua of breaking the Torah. Which they didn't. Because he, first of all, it says that they were false witnesses. And second of all, there's no example of them actually ever doing it. Right? And the same thing happened with Paul in Acts 21. James, Paul comes to town. James says, look, we've been hearing these things about you, how you're teaching against the Torah. Uh, to the Jews. So, to prove these accusations wrong, how about you go sacrifice some offerings in the temple with these four other believers, and that'll prove to everyone that you're not anti-Torah, you're just being confused. Or you're, you're, other people are confused and they're misunderstanding you. 
Paul actually does this. He listens to James, right? Because, first of all, James was in charge, so he, he kind of had to. And second of all, it's a, it's a great suggestion, I would say. So, again, our old friend Hegesippus, who we've mentioned before, he gives us a more elaborate account and gives us the whole story about how the Pharisees actually come to James. They say, look, we, we know that you're a very honorable person. Come, tell the people that Yeshua is not the Messiah. And James gets up in the Temple Mount and he says, Attention, everyone, everyone, everyone. Everybody goes quiet. Yeshua is the Messiah. That's all. Have a good day. And of course this is going to infuriate them because they did exactly, he did exactly what they didn't want him to do. And so, at least according to the story, they push him off the Temple Mount and kill him. But, uh... Which one of these accounts is true? I think that Josephus' account is true. But the very fact that, according to Christian sources, the Pharisees respected James, I think that that's probably correct. Uh, but again, that's just my opinion. So, in regards to Shimon, who is either Yeshua's brother or cousin, it's kind of difficult to ascertain that sometimes. He's possibly the Shimon of Matthew 13, 55 and Mark 6, 3. He's also possibly the Shimon the Zealot of Acts 1, verse 13. And if so, then he would have actually been within Yeshua's inner circle of 12. And so, if this is the same Shimon, then we find that Yeshua's brother or cousin, whoever he is, was actually one of the 12 apostles, which I think that's pretty neat. But regardless of whether he was actually mentioned in the New Testament at all, early church records say that he was in charge after James. And so, whoever he was, after James was murdered by the government or whoever, which, isn't that funny? It's, it's always the government that's killing these people. Um, which is exactly what Josephus says that Herod would do to the Pharisees. Interesting. Uh, that's beside the point, though. Um, so whoever he was, he's somehow related to Yeshua, and he was put in charge after James was killed. Uh, and that's all we've got, because we don't know a whole lot about him, because I guess apparently he wasn't very famous, or people didn't want to preserve his memory, because, and let's face it, what kind of Gentile church wants to preserve the memory of a Jewish, Hebrew-speaking, Torah-teaching descendant of Yeshua when they have nothing to do with that. There's no commonality. So, that wouldn't surprise me either. Then, there's also Yosef, and it's possibly the Yosef of Acts chapter 1, where we read, and again, this is all possibilities in terms of identifying them. It's not saying that maybe they existed, maybe they didn't, we know that they existed, we just don't really know who they are, or they were. So, it's possible that this is referring to the Acts chapter 1, Joseph. Therefore, it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us. So basically, we need to find someone who's been here since Yeshua was baptized which, according to the Gospel of the Hebrews, his whole family went to go be baptized with him. Now, who was involved with the family? It could have just been his brothers, sisters, and mother. Maybe even Joseph, his father. Or maybe Yosef, his cousin, or brother, whoever. Maybe he also went with. And so then he would have actually been with Yeshua since the beginning. So it's kind of making sense. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Yosef, called Barsabbas, which I believe means son of the father in Hebrew. Um, but his Latin name was apparently Yostus, and Matthias. So two of these guys, Joseph and Matthew. And this is a different Matthew than the tax collector, by the way. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, know the hearts of all men. 
show which one of these two you have chosen, and to occupy this ministry and this apostleship, from which Judas Iscariot turned aside to go to his own place. Which, by the way, turning aside to go to your own place, that's a very kind way. Uh, it's a it's a Semitism. It's a Semitic phrase of saying, he went off and did his own thing. Which, we all know what it's referring to, right? And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, or Matthew, and he was added to the eleven apostles. So, Joseph was up for nomination. Why was he nominated? Why was he so righteous and so and had been with Yeshua from the very beginning? Why did the apostles think that he was the best choice? Or one of the two best choices, I should say. Maybe because he was part of Yeshua's family. And just because Matthew, or Matthias, was picked, it doesn't mean that he was necessarily the best between the two men. It simply means that that's who God chose for that particular aspect of the ministry, because perhaps Joseph had to go do other things. We don't know. But this is possibly the Joseph that we find in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, where we find, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So we find not only that uh, this Yosef is mentioned, but we also find that a Jude, or Yehuda, Judas, is mentioned, and also Shimon, and Yaakov, James, and Mary, and his sisters. And so this is, this is partly where we're getting some of this information from. Now what's interesting is that Josephus, I'm sorry, not Josephus, Joseph, <laughs> uh, Yosef, was a very common name at this time. So sometimes it can be kind of difficult to precisely determine which Yosef in the New Testament is the relative of Yeshua, if any. Perhaps he's not even mentioned in the New Testament. Um, that it, it would take too long to explain, but it really shouldn't surprise us whether he was or was not. So it's very possible that this is the same Joseph. It's very possible that this was a cousin who knows? Now, in terms of Yehuda, or Judah, or Jude, it's all the same name, by the way. Um, in fact, in German, when you say the, the name Jude, it's Yuda. And that's just the differences in language. He is the author of the Epistle of Jude. Surprise, surprise, right? Jude wrote the Epistle of Jude. Uh, and he, something that's interesting that a lot of scholars have picked up on, is that he actually quotes from the book called First Enoch, which is not part of the Bible, nor should it be part of the Bible. But he apparently saw something in this book, or at least the form of the book that he had at the time, because who knows if what we have today is actually the original. But he pulls this out, or maybe he himself even believed it, I don't know. But that doesn't make it a biblical book, remember? When we covered the non-canonical books, there's plenty of books that are true, Right, A biography of Abraham Lincoln is true, but it doesn't mean that it's biblical. Right, So perhaps Jude thought that this book was true, and maybe it is true, who knows. And he quotes from this book of Enoch. And he exhorted his audience to repent and embrace righteousness, which is basically the main message of both John the Baptizer and Yeshua. Now it's interesting, according to the Tyndale Notes, if you know, the Tyndale is uh, one of the very earliest English Bible translations. According to the Tyndale notes regarding the book of Enoch, <clears throat> it says, This book was designed by its author to protest against the growing secularization of the Pharisaic party through its fusion with political ideals and popular messianic beliefs. Its author... So who wrote the book of Enoch according to the Tyndale notes? Its author, a Pharisaic quietist, sought herein to recall his party to the old paths, where they were, for, where they were fast forsaking, of unobtrusive obedience to the Torah. He foresaw, perhaps, 
the doom to which his country was hurrying under such a short-sighted and unspiritual policy. So according to the Tyndale notes, the one who wrote the book of First Enoch was... I, I don't think anybody thinks that it was actually written by Enoch. So who wrote it? It appears in the 2nd century BC, or around that time. And he says, who wrote it? It was a Pharisaic quietist who wanted people to return to the Torah. And here we have Jude, who is part of this Hasidic dynasty, the brother of Yeshua the Hasid. He's quoting a book written by a Pharisee, possibly. And to think that he didn't even kind of agree with it, I think that's a bit of a stretch. But I just thought that was interesting. I just wanted to throw that out there for uh, people's intellectual uh, appreciation, enjoyment, I guess. Um, so examples of Hasidus from Jude's epistle. He says a few things, some great things. He says, Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Oh, oh, oh this is this is overwhelmingly Hasidic, right? Mercy, peace, love be to you in abundance, right? It almost sounds kind of New Agey, but it's not. It's totally Jewish. Uh, the New Age is ripped off of us, right? Uh, there's also condemnation of the unrighteous and immoral. So as much love as there is going around, there's also equal condemnation of unrighteousness and immorality. Uh, for actually, for longer passages than the, the love. But these are both Hasidic things, right? The love and the kindness and the mercy and the peace and the, the everything. But also piety, justice, and righteousness. In verses 22 through 23, we read, Be merciful to those who doubt. Don't come down on them very hard, right? They're having a hard time. They're doubting. Go to them, be gentle, and encourage them. Snatch others from the fire and save them. Wait, we can save people? <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm trying to throw a, a wrench into the gears of our traditional thinking. So, To others, show mercy mixed with fear. This doesn't mean go scare them. It just means with reverence. Right? Be merciful, be gentle, be kind, but don't compromise. To the extent that you even hate the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Which, by the way, how could your flesh be corrupted? Isn't it just spiritual stuff now? No. Because there are things that can defile the body, and then there's things that can defile the soul. And what he's saying is that even the clothes that an unclean person wears, don't even touch them. Now granted, to save their life? Yeah. To, you know, if they break their leg, can you help them up? And oops, I accidentally touched a, a thread hanging off of their shirt. That's not what it's talking about, right? Again, it, some of it comes down to this this balance, this this uh, balancing between mercy and justice, where if if it's a dead equal, if if they're dead even, mercy wins, and it's preferable. But when you can both be righteous and gracious and merciful and loving then do both, right? It's the, it's the same kind of theme that we have going on here. So, as for our last slide, I think that we're doing pretty well on time so far. According to Eusebius, who we will be uh, visiting many, many more times, <laughs> uh, at least that's my intention right now, um, Eusebius, who is the, the 4th century early Christian historian, he says the following. He says... We have not ascertained, or we have not determined, in any way the times of the bishops of Jerusalem. Uh, excuse me. The bishops of Jerusalem have been regularly preserved on record, for tradition says that they all lived by a very short time. 
So much, however, have I learned from writers that down to the invasion of the Jews under Hadrian, which I believe was in 132 AD, I think, it's just something like that, there were 15 successions of bishops in that church, all which, they said, were Hebrews from the beginning, and they received the knowledge of Christ pure and unadulterated. So the Nazarenes were the ones who had the original teachings of Jesus. And he says right here, right? And the Nazarenes, as we know, were headquartered in Jerusalem beginning uh, with the leadership of James. Or really with Yeshua. In the estimation of those who were able to determine, those who were able to judge, they were well approved and worthy of the Episcopal office. At that time, the whole church under them consisted of faithful Hebrews. Now, what is he saying? Is he saying that they all abandoned the Torah and they became Christians and they started eating pork chops? He says that they were all Hebrews and they received the knowledge of Christ pure and unadulterated. Now, what do we know from our other historical sources and from the New Testament itself? That they didn't abandon the Torah. They didn't even abandon their culture or their traditions. The traditions being kind of a bridge between law and culture. They spoke Hebrew. They used the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew. Right? Which, by the way, early church historians say that the Gospel of Matthew was originally written in Hebraidi which is the dialect of the Hebrews, which could either refer to the language of Hebrew or Aramaic, but they're basically the same language almost. We find that this is not a Christian group. It is a Hasidic Jewish group that later Christians look to for inspiration, but they didn't follow. Basically, you guys have a lot of good stuff going on. That's cool. You can do that. We're going to do something else. Oh, and from time to time, we'll look to you guys for either authority or inspiration for either inspiring us what to do if we don't know what to do because we're starting a new religion. We don't have all the answers. Or we'll look to you for authority to defend the things that we come up with a hundred years from now. So that's kind of how things are starting to uh, turn out for the church. And so by this time, we are in the mid to late first century, going into the second century. We're actually on our plane, our, uh, our scholarly plane here. We have flown from Adam to Mo Abraham to Moses to Ezra to the Maccabees to the first century with Yeshua and John the Baptizer. And we're right on the border We've entered the domain of Yeshua, and now we are leaving and we're entering the domain of the second century. Now, we're not quite there yet. We're not quite leaving. We've got our passports ready, but we're not quite leaving yet. So, But we'll leave that to another time. I hope that this has been educational and beneficial, and I hope that this has been a blessing to you, and hopefully this makes things make more sense. It is informative. And it helps us to realize that Yeshua's family, whether his direct mother and brothers, or even extended family like cousins or nephews, that they had a much larger role in the original movement than what is often portrayed or what is often taught. And so, with that, you've probably had enough of me by now. Uh, so, we'll leave it at that. Hopefully this has been... Uh, fun. Hopefully this has been uh, beneficial and inspiring. So, have a good day. Be a chassid.